Welcome back to this edition of Beyond Addiction. My name is Adrian Webster, and I'd like to share with you a topic that's quite close to my heart. In our previous episode, we had a look at the science behind alcohol. We looked at alcohol as a drug. We uh, discovered how it affects the neurobiology of the brain, some of the physiological effects, and we really ended off by saying that when one considers how alcohol works in the system, it really is on a par with other drugs. Therefore, it was really probably not the best type of drug to be using or the best substance to be using from a scientific perspective. Despite the praise that's associated with alcohol, alcohol and its beneficial effects and all the rest of it, there are serious risk factors from a scientific, neurobiological, physiological uh, perspective. Addiction, there's risk for addiction, there's risk for uh, all sorts of strange things happening when one is drunk, there's increased risk of accidents, all the rest of that. But whenever one presents that subject, there is always somebody in the audience who wants to put up their hand and say, yes, but Adrian, what about alcohol in the Bible? Doesn't the Bible actually promote the use of alcohol? Yes, maybe not tobacco, maybe not caffeine, maybe not other drugs, but isn't alcohol in a different league because of the Bible's teaching on alcohol? So that's really the task in this particular lecture, which I've entitled Under the Radar, Socially Acceptable Drugs, and we are doing part number four in this little subsection of the Beyond Addiction series in which we are looking at alcohol in the Bible. Well, let's do a basic overview quickly, and then we will go through a number of verses and look at this. Because of the shortness of time, I hope you will understand, we cannot look at every single reference to alcohol in the Bible, but we're going to try and group them in categories and deal with examples within each category. And then you, if you would like to continue the study, you may go take up the Bible and go through the rest of the references. Take a concordance and go have a look. First of all, the first thing we note is that the Old Testament uses a variety of words which are translated into English using only one of two terms, and that is wine or strong drink. So we need to consider what is the difference between wine and strong drink, and we want to start by asking ourselves, what is strong drink? Does the Bible's use of strong drink condone strong drink? And if it does, what is it relative to what we know as the variety of alcohol in our current day society? Strong drink, the first thing we need to know about it is that until around 500 AD, only natural fermentation processes were available. The, the modern way of distilling a high alcohol volume content drink, you know, 45%, 43%, like brandies and, and all sorts of other types of distilled liquor, that process did not exist until about 500 AD. This means that only natural fermentation processes were around until that date, which means in turn that about the maximum, the maximum alcohol content by volume in strong drink would have been about 14% alcohol. We know this because when we consider the biblical language and the biblical term here being shikar, uh, we, we can find a similarity in the Babylonian cuneiform tablets in which a strong drink is there spoken of called shikaru. And you can see the, the similarity in the word. It's referring to the same thing, just in two different languages. And we have a recipe for how they made shikaru in Babylon. It was basically a grain mash which was allowed to ferment. So what are we talking about then? If it's made from grain, fermented grain, what is that? That is like modern day beer. That is not strong drink as we know strong drink referring to hard liquor or spirit liquor. It is actually referring to beer. So the Bible refers to beer as strong drink and it refers uh, also to wine. So one thing we know is that the Bible gives no license for the use of hard liquor of the present day. The high volume content spirit liquors that uh, we know in our, in our bottle stores, that is not referred to in Scripture and that is not given permission to use by Scripture. So we want to stay away from that altogether. So what about the beer and what about the wine? Lesser forms of alcohol if you, if you consider it that way, lesser by volume anyway. 
Well, out of the 21 times that Scripture speaks of strong drink, shekar, it is negatively mentioned 19 times, and the other twice it is referring to special circumstances. So 21 times speaking about strong drink or beer, and out of those times, the vast majority, 19 of the 21, is speaking about uh, the negative effects, the dangers, stay away from the substance, the other two referring uh, to very special circumstances, which would not justify the recreational use of beer and strong drink the way we use it in our societies today. Social drinking, party drinking, levity of heart, and all the rest of it. For instance, here's one example of the special circumstances uh, referring to strong drink. It says here, you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or similar drink, and that word there, similar drink, shakar, strong drink, for whatever your heart desires. Now surely there's a, I mean, if you just take that verse at face value out of its context like that, it sure sounds like the Bible allows the use of strong drink or beer. However, in the broader context of the verses that go before it, it's actually been used here as a form of tithe payment. Uh, the first few verses in this pericope of verses here refers to the fact that, that the Israelites were to bring their tithes to the sanctuary. However, there were circumstances where someone lived far away. They could not get to the sanctuary. They were supposed to bring the first fruits of their grains uh, that they had harvested out of the field, the first fruits of the fruit of the vine, the, the tirosh, which is a, the Hebrew word for unfermented wine. They were to bring this to the sanctuary as tithe. However, in a situation where they couldn't get there on time. They had to sell those goods as tithe, uh, retain the silver or the gold, the money. Then when they went to the sanctuary, they had to go and buy uh, what they needed to return as tithe. However, instead of a young calf, they had to bring a fully grown cow. Bef instead of a, 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 a young uh, lamb, they had to bring a fully grown sheep. And instead of the early wine, the unfermented wine, they had to bring yayin, which was uh, fermented wine. And instead of the grain, the fresh grain, they had to bring fermented grain. In other words, you see a progression here. There was a symbol of the tithe being returned late, and so instead of the young lamb, they had to bring a fully grown sheep. There was almost a penalty involved, because a fully grown sheep, the fully grown animal, was more expensive than the younger uh, uh, newborn animal. So instead of the, the firstborn and the, the young, they had to bring the mature. In a similar way, the fruit of the vine and the fruit of the grain, they had to bring the fermented versions, indicating that this was late. So this was a special circumstance, not a permission for the general recreational use of these beverages. It was symbolic of the fact that the tithe was being returned late. When we go over to the concept of wine in the Old Testament, we find those two words. Tirosh, referring to new wine, used about 38 times in Scripture. And Yayin, which refers exclusively to fermented wine, some 140 times in Scripture. Also, of the 140 times that the Bible mentions yayin, 60 times are negative, another 60 times approximately it is mentioned with no value judgment, and at 17 times it's apparently positive. Ah, okay, wait a second. So, so far what we know is the Bible does not give us a, leg a leg legitimate um, excuse for using the hard liquors of the day, point number one. Point number two of the times where it refers to beer or strong drink, which is a higher alcohol volume content than the wine in biblical times, uh, it says there that, uh, well, most of the times it's used negatively, and of the two times it's, it's special circumstances, so we cannot uh, get permission from Scripture to use that. But what about the wine? Isn't that the one that people want to use? Isn't it the red wine that everybody wants to have with their meals and so on? Well, as we say, 17 times apparently positive, so surely, Adrian, that gives us legitimacy for at least using uh, wine. However, however, of the instances where yayin, wine, fermented wine, is mentioned positively, uh, we note first of all that one classification of those instances where it is mentioned posit positively is that it's simply mentioning valid observations of physiological effects. So Psalm 104 verse 15, we'll find it twice in Ecclesiastes where it seems to almost encourage the use. These are almost the clearest. Those three verses, two in Ecclesiastes, one in Psalm 104 verse 15, almost seem to be the most uh, promotion, or, or most uh, encouraging use of, of yayin, except that really what's being described there is that yes, 
Yes. Guess what? When you drink wine, it makes the heart merry. Yes, when you drink wine, there are positive physiological effects. Just like in our scientific presentation, the one before, we did outline that there are some positive effects. People say it reduces stress and all of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that because a, a substance has a positive effect that it's healthy for you or that the Bible promotes it in any way. I mean, cocaine has some positive effects. Uh, marijuana has some positive effects. Smoking cigarettes have some positive effects. Of course there are positive effects. That's why people do them. But we have to evaluate the big body of evidence to decide whether it is safe to do despite those apparently positive uh, observations. So we also notice here that another group of texts which seem to be positive is where wine is used as a metaphorical comparison. So for instance, in Song of Solomon, it compares the, the, the love of his life to some aspects of the wine, etc., etc. And then another group of texts where Yayin is mentioned positively is where it is used as drink offerings. But even then, it was poured out. The fermented wine was not drunk by the priests. In fact, the priests were forbidden in the Old Testament to drink wine. So we could extrapolate that and say, if you are some sort of religious leader or an elder, or a pastor in the present day and age, it's definitely forbidden in that context. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, we would take those that fermented wine in the context of tithe and offering, drink offering, and it would be poured out at the base of the altar. It would not be consumed by human beings. So of these apparently positive uh, mentions of yayin, which is fermented wine, we really cannot draw a conclusion that the Bible permits the use of it. When you consider the broad body of evidence in Scripture, you'll find the Scriptures, the bulk of the evidence rests on the warning to stay away from yayin, to stay away from the, the fermented wine and the strong drink, the beer and all the rest of it. So from a biblical perspective, this broad over, overview, we really should be careful about trying to use the Bible to justify our recreational social drinking patterns. This is not what scripture teaches. Indeed, we go on now to look at a number of different verses in the Bible. Let's try and take a few samples and go through this briefly. First of all, let's look at the concept of drunkenness in the Bible. This would speak to our modern day and age of the way we use alcohol for partying and for recreation and for having a good time and just getting sort of, you know, letting your hair down and just having a good time with your friends, you know, getting kind of out of it for a while. What does the Bible say about drunkenness? Very clear verses in regard to drunkenness in the Bible. No room for misunderstanding. First of all, in Proverbs 23 verse 20, we read this warning. Do not mix with wine bibbers <laughs> or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. Those that have not drawn their appetites into subjection to the higher nature, to, to the frontal lobe functioning, to, to the intelligent area of the brain, those who give themselves over to the seeking of pleasure, to do the drinking of alcohol or the, the overindulgence in food. The Bible says we should not hang around with those people. We should not be in their company. So we should not be going to those parties, those office parties or those club parties or those Parties at people's homes where people are getting drunk. We should not be in the association of those people. We should not be uh, getting drunk with them. We should not be overeating. We should control our appetite. Proverbs 23, 29 to 30 says, Who has woe and who has sorrow? Asking us an important question. Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? And then, who has redness of eyes? The answer comes to us in the following words. Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Very clearly, again, the Bible saying, we, if we want happiness out of life, if we want that fulfillment, if we want the contentment, it's not going to be in the party zone. It's not going to be in the place where people are getting drunk, getting out of their minds, using substances such as alcohol. Proverbs 20 verse 1 warns us that wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Whoever is led astray by it, it, you know, it invites, it calls, it seems so appetizing. But the Bible says if you give into it, you are not wise. If you go in search of the wine, if you go drinking the wine, you are not wise. How is it that these clear passages of Scripture, some people try to negate this body of literature warning against the dangers of wine, 
with one or two or three texts which seem to speak about it positively. The Bible cannot contradict itself, friends. The bulk of the evidence is a strong warning against it. Stay away from the wine. Do not get drunk with wine. It will not satisfy. It will not fulfill the contentment need of your heart. It will do exactly the opposite. It will give you problems. It will get you fights. It will get you broken relationships. It will mock you, for it calls you with the promise of reward, but in the end, it makes you lie low in the dust. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 11 says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they may follow intoxicating drink who continue until night, till wine inflames them. You know, this is the characteristic pattern of an alcoholic, one who must use his alcohol all the time, even at early times of the day. The Bible warns us not to go in that direction. It warns us against the principle of drunkenness. Isaiah, 50, Isaiah 5, sorry, verse 22 says, Woe to men mighty in drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. I remember as a young person how, you know, our drinking habits were the way that we almost showed our macho-ness. You know, I can have six beers before I even feel half drunk. Oh, he, can, he can't handle his alcohol. After one or two beers, he's really out of it. What does the Bible say about that? He says, if you, are, if you are making your proof of a manhood, if you are making your identity and your name for yourself in, in the way you can handle your alcohol and the way you can party, you know, that's your reputation. This is a man valiant. He can handle his drink. He can drink a whole bottle of cane or a whole bottle of whiskey and he's still got it together, you know, uh, that, 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 that he can handle his alcohol well. The Bible says, you're a fool. You're a fool. That is not how we are to measure our manhood. And that's not how, what our reputation ought to be for. But they also have erred through wine. Speaking of the false prophets and the false leaders in Israel. Isaiah 28 verse 7. They have erred also through wine and through intoxicating drink. They are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. The drinking of wine and strong drink is not something that is compatible with healthy spiritual experience. If you are in a leadership position in the church of God, you should not be drinking alcohol or wine in any circumstances. It can have negative impact on your spiritual leadership. We may begin to misunderstand even spiritual things. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Why? Because they're intoxicating themselves with alcohol. It's clouding their mind. They cannot communicate Communicate with God properly. If you want to be serious about your spirituality, then the alcohol, according to Scripture, has got to go. It says in Romans 13, verse 13, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Can you see how drunkenness is in the same sentence as other uh, other clear moral falls, other clear sinful tendencies, strife and envy, that is an issue of the Ten Commandments right there. Revelry and drunkenness fits in with that. Lust and lewdness about the Seventh Commandment there. How is it that drunkenness is placed by the Bible writer in the New Testament right in the context of the breaking of God's law and sinful tendency? Clearly not a positive picture of alcohol in the Bible. Clearly not a positive picture of drunkenness in the Bible. So the question is, what about moderate drinking though? Clearly we cannot get away from the fact Scripture is against drunkenness. It's against intoxication. It's against using liquor to the point where I am out of it and where I cannot think clearly. But somebody's always going to say, yes, but that doesn't speak about moderate drinking. Surely the Bible actually encourages moderate drinking. Moderate drinking is different to getting drunk. We need to know when to stop. Well, yes, we should know when to stop, but I would suggest to you the place to stop when it comes to alcohol is before we've even started. So let's have a look here at moderate drinking in the Bible. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, it says, uh, directly from the hand of the Bible writer, Paul, writing to, the, to his protege, Timothy, and what does he say? No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So what do we know about Timothy? Timothy was a teetotaler. We know that Timothy was somebody who wasn't using any alcohol at all because Paul actually says to him, you know, stop just drinking water, but start to drink wine. Now, what does that mean? Does that legitimize the use of moderate drinking, the, 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 the legitimize the use of alcohol uh, for a Christian? Be careful now, be careful now. Notice how Paul connects the use of wine with infirmities and stomach ailments. In other words, he's saying to Timothy, there is a legitimate medicinal use for the substance. By the way, some 
commentators on this passage actually indicate that is not even necessarily alcoholic wine that's being referred to, but a, a thick concentrate of fresh uh, grape juice that was preserved in a fresh form, which one would mix with water, and this would have healing properties for the stomach. But even if you want to interpret it as alcoholic wine in this particular case, notice that is not legitimizing its use for social purposes or anything else. It's medicinal purposes. In the same way that all our illegal drugs that we are going to be talking about in the next few sessions, or, or, or even some of our, our uh, socially acceptable drugs, like this caffeine, for instance, where, how we've outlined the fact that drugs are medications and medications are drugs, and that some of these things may have legitimate medical purposes given certain circumstances and certain health conditions. So too here, this Bible text is not using, uh, not telling Timothy to go ahead and just drink it at, at will for, for recreational purposes. He's saying there may be a legitimate medical purpose because you're struggling with a particular situation. So even if you interpret this as alcoholic wine, it's not legitimizing the use of al alcoholic wine for our recreational purposes of the 21st century. Notice the warning here in Proverbs 23, verses 31 to 32. It says, Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent, and it stings like a viper. Isn't that one of the most well-known verses on the subject? What is the author saying? The author is saying very plainly that when you look at that wine, you start off by just wanting to enjoy a glass of it, right? We call that moderate drinking. He's saying, don't even look at it when it swirls around in the glass and it calls you just one sip, just one wine, uh, just one glass of wine. You know, moderate drinking. Just have a little bit. It looks so good. It smells so good. It's so inviting. The Bible author says, no, what happens is when you drink that wine, you, your inhibitions begin to fall. You think just another one glass and before you know it, you're drunk and it's biting like a viper and it's stinging you. You see, what, what it's saying here, if I may paraphrase into modern English, is that, that moderate drinking is the school in which men and women are trained for the alcoholic's career. You know, no one decides one day, I'm going to be an alcoholic. I'm just going to give myself over to drunkenness. Most people who become drunkards do not intend to be drunkards. They intend to just drink the occasional social drink with a friend, the occasional glass of red wine with their meal. One glass becomes two, and over a period of time, they're drinking the whole bottle, and eventually they're moving on to stronger alcohol forms, and they're getting drunk. No one intends to be an alcoholic, just like no one intends to be a heroin addict. We start with the lesser drugs, and we graduate to the higher. So here in the book of Proverbs, moderate drinking is warned against because of the potential for addiction, because of the potential for long-term uh, abuse that may lead to heavy drinking. So of course, when the Bible speaks about moderate drinking, it's not giving us a license to go ahead and drink moderately. In fact, it's warning us, be careful. You may think you can handle your alcohol. You may think you can handle that little bit of red wine that swirls around in the glass. But at the end of the day, it may sting you like a viper. It may come, to, to, come back to bite you. So very, we've got to be very careful about moderate drinking as well. And then finally, let me end off by speaking a little bit about alcohol and Christian example. Okay, so you're one of those people, you have been drinking one glass of red wine for the last 20 years of your life, you've never graduated to anything heavier, you never got on to, to, to become a heavy drinker or an alcoholic, so it must be okay for you, right? Well, notice this verse from Scripture when it speaks about example. It says, Romans 14, verse 21, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is made weak. So your child sees you drinking a bit of red wine over the years. They start drinking a bit of red wine over the years. But then they cannot handle it. How would you feel if your example led to the downfall of your child? Though you had in your mind Christian liberty to engage in moderate drinking, and maybe you were able to maintain it there, how would you feel if your child was ruined eternally because of your bad example? How would you feel if, if because of your desire to exercise your legitimate Christian freedom, according to your interpretation of Scripture, you went on and it, it ruined somebody else in the church or somebody else in your community who could not handle what you could handle. 
You see, we have to consider not only our personal liberties. Paul is clear about this in Scripture, that even though I may have certain liberties in my mind, uh, my understanding of Scripture, I may still put those liberties on hold because I'm worried about the influence and the impact it will have on the greater community. I'm not just living for myself and the most that I can get out of life, but I am also trying to live as a good example to others. And I realize that this thing is dangerous. I realize that not everyone can handle their alcohol. So So even if I do still believe after our study of Scripture that I can still legitimately, according to Scripture, engage in moderate drinking, I plead with you to consider the example that you will have on others who may be watching you. The bottom line I take from the New Testament Scripture where it says the following, that there is something better that God has for us, friends. Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Notice how being filled with the Spirit and being drunk with wine are antithesis to one another. You, you cannot have the one without, w- with the other one. The two are mutually exclusive according to the Bible writer. If we're going to engage in drunkenness, if we are going to be drinking alcohol, then God is not going to be sharing with us His Spirit. The, the Bible writer says there's a better way to spend your days. There is a better goal for the Christian. We ought to be focusing on spiritual realities. We ought to be wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and not be concerned about pleasure seeking and going out after the alcohol and the substance and all the rest of it. He says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. It's pointless. It's empty. It's not going anywhere. It, it leads to moral degradation and moral falls. He says, stay away from the wine. Stay away from the alcohol, but be filled with the Spirit. God is longing to give you His Holy Spirit. He is longing to fill you with the Spirit. When you go through Scripture, you'll find numerous occasions on which men and women who were called to special places in the service of God were specifically instructed not to engage in the drinking of wine. I think of Samson. I think of John the Baptist. I think of the example of Jesus. And someone's going to say, yes, but what about the wedding at Cana? Surely there, Jesus turned the water into wine, alcoholic wine. Not necessarily, friend. When you look at the bulk of information in Scripture and you understand what, what, that, that Jesus is the author behind the Scriptures, that He, through the Holy Spirit, inspires those Scriptures. He gives all those warnings and the prohibitions against strong drink and against wine. Now He comes as God incarnate. He goes to a wedding. Do you think he's going to just produce uh, an an exorbitant amount of wine there for all these guests to to have a drunken party? It doesn't make any sense when you reason through it from cause to effect. There was so much wine that he produced there that it would not have been under the moderate drinking category. It would have promoted drunkenness. Is that what Jesus is going to do? Is he going to bless the wedding with his presence and then provide a forum where people may exhibit the lack of self-control and maybe get drunk and, and do crazy things? Is that what he was going to do at the wedding jeopardize the celebration of this holy union, the highest form of of human relationships? Was he going to jeopardize that celebration in the presence of God at the reception by producing highly alcoholic wine, which would get everybody drunk and, and, and go nuts? No, 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 friends. It doesn't make any sense. He is the author of the scriptures. He was the one that gave the prohibitions against wine and strong drink. How would he now, coming as man, give sanction to the use of wine in this context, in a party environment, in revelry environments, which we've clearly, we saw that word in other texts, warning us against drunken revelries and so on in the New Testament. It doesn't make sense. We place then the example of Jesus uh, in contrast to the clear teachings of scripture. Would he act contrary to the scriptures that he himself himself had inspired? I don't think so. The New Testament appeals to you. Focus on being filled with the Spirit. Turn to the Lord. Forget the parties, the drunken revelries. Stop trying to justify your social drinking and your moderate drinking. Set that stuff aside. It will be health to your mind, health to your soul. And through the Spirit of God, you will be filled with a far better experience. God never takes something away from us without giving us something much better in return. To the drunkard, to the party animal, to the one who enjoys his social drinking, the, the, the red wine, the white wine, the beer, whatever it is, God says, come out of that lifestyle, come out of that uh, practice, and I will give to you my Holy Spirit, which will fill you with genuine power, which will fill you with a genuine spiritual experience, which will far exceed any of the perceived rewards that the social drinking or the drunkenness may seem to offer on the surface of it. May God bless you as you consider the evidence of Scripture. And I trust that your decision will be made intelligently by the leading of the Spirit to move away from the use of alcohol and not to seek to justify it by the the use of the Holy Scriptures. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, will you bless the viewer? 
Will you help them as they continue to study this subject in more detail, turning through the pages of Scripture? Give them an overall picture that will encourage them, Lord, to seek first and foremost and above all else the infilling of your Holy Spirit. Give them spiritual power in their lives and through the presence of that Spirit, give them spiritual discernment as well. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.